I was praying around the thought of, or around this night, and the thought came to me, strengthened at the altar. And I've preached from this text before. And God gave me fresh revelation out of it for us tonight. In Genesis 13, verses 1 to 4, it's when Abraham was going back to a place that he should have never left. So then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel. Now, Bethel means the house of God. It's a place that Jacob ultimately would have his encounter when he would lay his head down on a rock and go to sleep, where he had a vision of angels ascending and descending. There was a ladder from where he was into the very heavens. And the angels were going up and coming back. Represents the gathering place where we ascend into the mind of Christ we we'll receive revelation, and it empowers us to go out and do life. This is the place where Abraham is. It says he was in this place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord, and he called on his name. Bible says that Abraham is a father of faith. He is the example of how faith works. He is one of the great patriarchs mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 by faith. He had such incredible faith when God came into his life and spoke to him. He walked away from his country. He walked away from his friends, his family. He left his father's house. He had such incredible faith, he was willing to follow God, even though God didn't tell him exactly where he was going. People said, where are you going, Abraham? He said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Can you show me the destination? Can you pull up GPS? If I speak to Siri, can I find you? He began walking simply as a result of hearing God say, go, not really knowing where he was headed, just trusting that God would guide his footsteps. So he's an example. He is the model of how faith works sometimes. God called him his friend. We all desire for God to be our friend, but have you ever thought about becoming his friend? So what God said about him. He said, Abraham's my friend. Wonder what God says about you. Wonder that about myself sometimes. God, do you call me friend? I want to be your friend. Do you want to be God's friend? Why don't we make this year the year that we become God's friend? He had the kind of faith that when God gave him a promise... He didn't let trials or tests. He didn't let adversity cause him to give up on it. He didn't just lay his dream down and put it on a shelf somewhere because it didn't happen or materialize or manifest when he thought it should. That it didn't come to pass the way he hoped it would. That's what many of us do sometimes. We kind of give up on dreams or put it to the side. I guess it just isn't going to happen. Abraham grabbed a hold of the promises of God by faith. The Bible says that with patience or endurance, you receive God's promises. It's the people who have the I won't quit spirit. I've never seen a quitter accomplish anything. God can't use quitters. Now, if you've quit, get back up. Get back into the walk with God. Get back into this race. Start going after the Lord again. God gave him a promise and day after day, month after month, year after year, he didn't see it. Grew a little older, thought it was beyond his time. 
Just don't guess it's going to happen. But you know what I believe with all my heart? Are you ready? I believe with all my heart this year is going to be the year of the manifestation of the prophetic promises that God has given you. Things that God has spoken to you. Dreams that God has put in you. This is going to be the year that they materialize. You're going to see things happen that are supernatural. That's what happened for Abraham when that moment came where God wanted to to manifest the promise. It was supernatural. It was beyond the natural. He was at such a place in his life, the only way it could happen would be that it was supernatural. Abraham was a worshiper. First time the word worship is used in the Bible, it's used with Abraham. Now we can look all throughout the Old Testament, even back in to the very beginning of the garden, and we can see worship with Cain and Abel. But the word worship wasn't used. First time the word worship was used, it's when Abraham said, let me and my son go up there and worship. It was connected to sacrifice. Oftentimes we, in our American culture, we think about worship, sweet sounding music. I like that song. It does something for me. Worship wasn't about what God was doing for him. Worship was about what he was doing for God. Worship was a sacrifice. He was taking his son to sacrifice him on an altar. Of course, you know the story. Hopefully, you know the story. God said, stop right that moment. He is about to sacrifice his son. God was testing his heart. It's really a picture in the Old Testament of what God would do for us in the New Testament when sending his son, Jesus, into this world, giving him so that we could be saved. It's what it's a picture of. Real worship isn't about you just lifting your hands, even though that's a part of worship. Worship isn't about being a spectator. Worship isn't about you standing and watching and looking to see what kind of action is going to take place or... See what song they're going to do. They're going to do your favorite worship song. Real worshiper can worship whether there's an instrument playing or not. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. Those those things help. You can see that throughout the Bible. The scripture tells us that we're to worship God with all the instruments, the string instruments, the cymbals, and everything else. We're to use those to worship God. But a real worshiper doesn't have to have those to worship because a real worshiper is going to worship. You're going to worship. Real worshipers worship. They worship by the lifting of their hands. They worship by the opening up their heart and expressing their love and their passion for God. But a real worshiper is going to lay down their life in such a way that everything they do, the way they live, is an expression of their devotion to Almighty God. I will lay my life down to serve you, to walk with you. It's a pleasure to sacrifice. You know the greatest act of worship is when somebody completely surrenders their life totally to the Lord and said, not my will, but your will be done. That's worship on the highest level. You know the highest calling in Christianity? It's not that of an apostle. It's not that of a prophet. It's not a pastor, a teacher. It's not any of those things. Even though we should honor and respect those positions, those offices, the highest calling in the kingdom of God is that of a worshiper. So it's not limited to select individuals. It's been made available to all. There is not a person that's in the room that's that's watching online that doesn't have the invitation to step into a place of intimacy with God and become a worshiper. That's what God's looking for. Get your head around that for a moment. That God is looking, pursuing anybody that would desire to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's, that's, that's mind-blowing. Abraham was willing to lay everything down. The thing that God had promised him, because oftentimes the promises of God 
begin to be the thing that we idolize. We, we pray for things, we ask God for things, and God gives us things, and the things that God gave us begin to be the things that we worship. It happened in King Hezekiah's day when God used a brazen serpent on a stick to deliver them from the vipers, the snakes that were destroying and killing them. They took that brazen serpent down. They carried it over into the promised land and they began to worship it as if it was God. I wonder how many people started out with nothing. Didn't have two pennies to rub together in your pocket. And God began to promote you, open up doors. He helped you get your life together. But prior to getting your life together, nobody would ever open up a door giving you any kind of opportunity. God changed your life. He put you in a condition, in a position to be able to do something with your life. Then as God began to bless your life, you began to move God to the side or to the back. Rather than honoring him with it. People begin to worship the very things. They they may not burn incense or get on their knees and bow down before their bank account or their car or their home or some other thing. Or a wife or a husband or children. You pray for those things. God, give me a family. Give me a, a job. Help me to get through this. Make me something. Use me, God. And something begins to happen. And we begin to idolize it. It begins to control us. It controls us more than God controls us. Anything that you've allowed to control you more than God, it has now become your master. It's no different if you were to get down and bow before it. It's worship. Anything that controls you is your master. That's why Jesus don't want you to be controlled by anything other than him. He is Lord. He is master. He is savior. And he doesn't dominate us in a, in a closed fist type manner. Matter of fact, he sets us free and says, now you choose who you'll serve. People who are really thankful for their salvation, they surrender their life, and that's called becoming a bond servant. A bond servant in the scripture is somebody that's been delivered. They, they've been purchased. Back in that day, you could go purchase a, per, a slave, and you could purchase him, and you'd say, I'm going to set you free. And the slave would be so thankful that they'd been redeemed, they would say, I want to serve you with my life. It's called being a bond servant. Not everyone desires to give their life to the Lord in this matter. I'm telling you, this year is going to be very difficult, especially for people that don't give their whole life to Him. Casual Christianity is not going to get you very far. You're going to be shaken. I'm not doomsday prophet. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And judgment will first start at the house of God. Scripture describes a great falling away in the last days. I'm going to cling to Jesus in such a way that as things shake, it, I mean, if anybody's going to get shaken away, it's not going to be me. I'm hanging on to Jesus. Abraham was a worshiper of God. He consecrated himself. He was willing to walk away from everything that he was familiar with. That's consecration. When he said, I'm going to walk away from my my nature, I'm going to walk away from my friends, my relatives, I'm going to walk away from my father's house, I'm going to consecrate myself to Almighty God. Now that's real devotion. That's real faith. Say, I'm going to break away from all this just so I can walk with God. That's what Abraham did. You know why he did that? Because he ultimately had an altar that gave him strength. Some people are like, how do these people say strong? It's because they have an altar. When people neglect the altar, it's only a matter of time before they get weak. I remember hearing an old school preacher one time say, a once a week Christian will make a weak Christian. It's a place of sacrifice. That's what altars are. 
It is a place where God alters who you are. You come to the A-L-T-A-R and he A-L-T-E-R's you. Every now and then I'll go buy a pair of pants or a shirt or a jacket or something that needs to be altered so that it fits properly. After it goes to the seamstress and it's altered, it always fits better, looks better. People that spend time at an altar, they always look better. Because God makes them into who they're really supposed to be at the altar. Very important to have an altar. Do you have an altar? This altar should never be closed in. You should never just stand and look at this altar. This altar should be a place that you frequently visit. Ladies, single ladies, if you're looking for a man, if he's afraid of the altar, that's the first sign you need. He's not the right man. If he won't get on his knees and bow before the Lord, he's not the right man for you. The altar is a place where you call on Jesus. That's what he said that Abraham returned to that altar and he called on the name of the Lord. There's power in calling on him. You know, oftentimes we just say, Jesus, Jesus bless my day. Depending on what's going on in your life will determine how you call on Jesus. Come on. Come on. When everything's comfortable in your life, you may just like, with no passion. Jesus, be in my day, bless my day, take care of me, watch over me. But when you're really passionate for him, it's a little different the way you call on his name. The way you lean in with your heart. The way your mind's focused on him. There's a difference when he's the passion of your life. Are you getting what I'm talking about? Yeah. The altar is a place where you create healthy boundaries. The altar is a place where God will actually not only strengthen you, but you will have standards that begin to rise higher. The altar is a place where you will create these standards by where you will live because you don't want to offend or violate your relationship with God. Now, the altar is not limited to this church. The altar is your place of connection. It's a place of communion. That's what the altar is. It's a place of, I'm getting close to God. Do you have that place? Your car can be that place. You can sit and just sit sometimes and invite God into the car. Lord, Lord, I just, I'm going to consecrate this time to you. I'm just going to sit right here. I'm going to worship you and I'm going to pursue you in my heart. And I'm going to pursue you in this time. I've always had those special places. Sometimes it's walking on a trail through the woods. Other times it's literally been in a closet. My bedroom has been the place that I probably have made my altar the most over my Christian life. It's the place where I'll shut the door and I'll leave everything on the outside and I just get alone with God. Amen. Now I want to encourage you if you're not used to being alone with God, you need to get in that space until you know you're not alone anymore that God is with you in that space. There, there can get, you can get to a place where, where you just step right in with the Lord. You experience him. You know he's here. I can know he's here right now. I hope you can sense what I sense because God is in this place right now. Uh, it's a place where you have these standards. It's a place where you get strength. Altar at the Bible, you see people who had altars. Moses had an altar. Noah had an altar. Joshua had an altar. Saul had an altar. David had an altar. Do you have an altar? Is there a place that you connect to God? Really connect to God? I'm not talking about getting in to your bed and sitting there before you go to sleep. I'm talking about a place where you get on your knees. Come on. Come 
Will you lay on your face? You say, God, I'm not leaving this place until you touch me. I'm not leaving until you so touch me that it changes the way I walk, that it changes the way I live. The reason some people struggle with sins for five years, ten years, their entire Christian life is because they don't pursue God the way I'm describing. They don't get in the altar the way I'm describing. They don't lay on their face before God. They don't go after Him with all of their heart. They just casually, God, deliver me, set me free, change me, break the powers of this. They don't really go after God with everything. And they struggle, and they struggle, and they struggle, and they struggle, and they struggle. God loves you. And they struggle, and they struggle, and they struggle. Because they really don't go after God. You go after God. There's not a sin that can hold you. There's not a curse that can keep you. There's not a demon that can pull you back. You really go after God, sin loses its hold. Curses are broken off. Demons leave, they flee, they go. Because you go after God, God is not going to let anything stop you from getting to Him. Because all you've got to do is lean toward God, and God will move everything between you and Him to get to you. And God will make sure that you get to Him. That's why it's so important to call on His name. The altar is a place where God blesses you. The altar is a place where God directs you. God gave Abraham direction from the altar. He strengthened him for his walk and to go in the direction that he needed to. You got to quit consulting people about spiritual things that don't even know God or that all they know is pop talk verses and drink spiritual milk. You want to get somebody that's walking in victory. Somebody that's full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody that understands the Word of God. Somebody that's got some season on the inside of them. They got some time underneath their belt. Somebody that knows how to get free from something and stay free from something. That's who I want to tell me. If I'm a blind man, I'm not going to ask another blind man, what do you see? So here's what you do when you value God's presence and value your relationship with God such a high level. Anything that would stop you from going after Him, you will acknowledge it, you will admit it, and you will quit it. Some may say, I'm going to quit it. Too many people are being entertained by spirits. Spirits like the spirit of Delilah. God's anointed you. You're a champion. You look like Samson. You can take people out. You do got power. The spirit of Samson gets a hold of you. Or the spirit of Delilah gets a hold of you. And the next thing you know, you begin to deviate from what gave you your anointing. You begin, to com- you begin to compromise your vows. You know, the Bible says it's better not to have made a vow than to have made one and not kept it. You begin to compromise, and the next thing you know, Delilah's got her door open. She's got things smelling like a French brothel parlor. She gets you to lay your head in her lap. You got to watch where you put your head. You show me what's going on in your head. I'll show you where it's about to happen. Sometimes people are really good at keeping a face on if we could only see what was happening inside that head. Because the face you project isn't necessarily an indication of your future. It's the thoughts that loop in your head. Samson was mesmerized by the smell of Delilah. He walked away, but he still could smell the fragrance. Have you ever hugged someone that had on some perfume or cologne and it got on you and 30 minutes later, you just caught the fragrance of it? 
Have you ever walked through a department store and smelled a fragrance and it reminded you of someone? Scripture says that Abraham went down into Egypt. That's his mistake. He walked away from his altar. Anytime you go down, it's always going to lead you into a place you never thought you would end up. Prodigal son living in the father's house. He had everything that the father had provided for him. Got his inheritance. And there's this temporary sense of freedom when you leave the father's house. Because you have the blessing, but you don't have the father. There's no restraint. There's no covering. There's no voice of reasoning. It's just you taking God's blessing and using it at the pleasure of your flesh. When you remove the restraint of the Holy Spirit and totally give yourself to the flesh, sin is pleasurable. You know your Bible says that, but it says it doesn't last. It starts out very enjoyable. If sin wasn't enjoyable, you would have stopped the first time you did it. But because you enjoyed it, you said, I'm going to do some of that again. I want to try that again. I want to try him again. I want to try her again. I want to try that again. I want to go there again. Abraham went down into Egypt. When he went into Egypt, that's where you connect with people you had no business connecting with. Had he not gone into Egypt, he would have never connected with Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian. That's where he picked her up. He got into an ungodly soul tie. There have been times that I've helped people. And they'll say, man, I, I saw this person I dated years ago. We were promiscuous. We had sex. And when I saw them, I felt these emotions drawing me to them. It awakened this flame on the inside of me. I said, you know what that is, don't you? I said, that's a soul tie. I said, when you had sex with them, whatever was in them got into you. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 teaches that, right? That's why sex is never to be experienced outside of, the, outside of the context of covenant. It is a blessing inside of the context of covenant. And it's an expression of love and it's a gift from God. But when you go outside of the context of covenant, then there's an impartation and you pick up something that God never intended for you to pick up. You become one in your soul with somebody that God never intended for you to become one. And your soul gets fragmented because a part of you has been given away and they went their way and a part of you is now missing and now you're empty, you're hurting and you're wondering what's going on with you. Sometimes if you go from partner to partner to partner to partner, it can lead to your downfall mentally, emotionally and you're wondering wondering what's going on with you is because you gave yourself away here you gave yourself away there you gave yourself away there and you're no longer a whole person you're a fragmented person and a part of you has been scattered around from person to person to person and you pick up behaviors and passions and desires and struggles and you're like, why am I struggling with this? Why, why do I desire this? I didn't used to desire this. I didn't used to be like this. You picked it up when you laid with them. But I want you to know you can break that. Because here's what happens when you end up laying with the wrong people. You always end up, you, you will produce an Ishmael. An Ishmael. You know what Ishmael? The name Ishmael means... A wild ass man. And nobody wants to live with a wild ass all your life. Some of you like bad boys, but you don't want to live with a wild ass all your life. Because Ishmael calls problems. That's what ends up happening. And so Abraham, when he went down, because he went down because he went through a hard time, there was a famine. He went down because he was going through a difficult time. 
he left his altar. When he left his altar, he started to cross over into Egypt and he got afraid. Now, I told you Sunday, you can have faith and fear at the same time. You can be in faith and feel fear. The presence of faith doesn't mean the absence of fear. But fear is attempting to get a hold of your thoughts so that you quit living in faith and you start responding by the, to the fear. Fear is designed to get a hold of your mind. Fear is designed to control your thinking. Fear is designed to affect your behavior. It got such a hold on Abraham that Abraham quit walking by faith and began to make decisions out of fear. He says, now people are going to know Sarah. Sarah's his wife. People are going to know, Sarah, that, that you're beautiful. The scripture says she was, she was like Christy. Extremely beautiful. <laughs> and Abraham was like, when the king gets his eyes on you, he's going to want some of you. And he's going to kill me to get you. So let's tell him you're my sister. Now, Abraham really, he got a long ways away from his altar. Here's what happened. When you get away from the altar, you start doing things you never thought you'd do. You start thinking in ways you never thought you'd think. You start doing things. I bet Abraham didn't even recognize himself in that moment. This is the same guy that left his country, that left his friends, that left his father's house, that began to walk by faith, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And now he's making decisions out of fear rather than faith. He's telling lies because he's afraid. Took him down for a moment. So the, so the king took in Sarah because he got his eyes on her. And God said, you're messing with the wrong woman right now. And God released all kinds of turmoil into the king's house. Even when covenant people do stupid things, God takes it personal and says, now Abraham's not thinking right. Abraham's not behaving right. And Abraham's stupid thinking ain't going to get Sarah in trouble. So God said, I'm going to step in since Abraham didn't step in. And, And God released all kinds of chaos into the king's home. And the king's like, what in the world is going on? She's beautiful, but all kinds of hell is breaking loose in this house. The king discovered that was really Abraham's wife. King said, Abraham, you lied to me, dude. You better come get her, get out of here, leave me. Because all this craziness that's coming up on me is because of you. That's what happens when you get away from your altar. You lose your strength. And when you lose your strength, you become somebody that you don't even recognize. Who am I? How did I go from somebody that was saying, yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will do whatever you've called me to do. Now I'm lying and I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And when he left that king's house, he grabbed a hold of Sarah. He said, I'm sorry. I repent. He made his crooked path straight. He said, I got some repenting to do. This year, I want to encourage you right now, this month, don't wait. Don't say, I'm going to get it together. I'm going to go make things right. I'm going to make my crooked. Start making your crooked path straight now. The Bible said, when you make your crooked path straight, that which is lame can be healed. So he started doing some repenting. And Sarah said, I forgive you, but it's going to take a minute for me to trust you. So they started walking. Abraham said, let's go back to where I first pitched my tent and I first built that altar. I'm going to go back to that place where I got intimate with God. I want to go back to that place where I really connected with him. I'm going, let's go, let's go, Sarah. Let's go, Sarah. I got to go find myself. I got to go get the real me back. The me that God created me to be. The me that God showed up and said, I've chose you. And I'm going to change you. I'm going to so change you. We're going to change your name from Abraham to Abraham. I'm going to change you to such a level that you're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to give you, 
I'm going to give you more offspring than the stars in the sky. I'm going to bless you. Abraham's, I'm going back. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another minute. Don't put it off any longer. Make up your mind tonight. Make up your mind right now. Right now. I'm not going to live this way any longer. There's only one way I'm going to live. And that's at the altar. A life that surrendered. I'm going to worship. I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to walk with Jesus.